Zavodsky District of Minsk, 2015. On November 8th, a large-scale search was launched here. The police, volunteers, and up to 300 soldiers of internal troops of the Ministry of Internal Affairs went out to look for the body of Belarusian runner Yulia Balikina once a day. Her killer confessed to the crime, but did not name the place where he hid the corpse. The murderer, most likely, had a stereotype. No body, no case. And before I start the story, I'd like you to subscribe to the channel and click on the bell so you don't miss another story. And I'll continue. The athlete Yulia Balikina was wanted since October 28, 2015. On that day, she did not return home after work and stopped contacting her. During the inspection of her place of residence and car, evidence was obtained that the disappearance was of a criminal nature. Yulia Balikina was born on April 12th 1984 in Bulgan, Mongolia. She started training at the age of 18 in Zaporozhye, Ukraine, a very late age for professional sports. The same opinion was held by the first coach of the runner, Vasil Bodnar, who believed that Balikina's experience was not enough to get to the elite level. However, his mentor was convinced by the persistence and incredible diligence of his mentee who in just one year caught up with the results of her peers. At each new start, her results got better and better. When Vasily Bodnar received a lucrative offer from the Iranian Athletics Federation, he decided to move abroad to work, but he did not forget about his talented pupil. Bodnar turned for help to his good friend, Viktor Miasnikov, who coached the sprint team in Minsk and asked him to take Balakina to him. The Belarusian specialist became the second and last coach in the athlete's career. In 2008, Yulia moved to Belarus. Together with her new mentor, the girl became a multiple champion of Belarus in 100 and 200 meters, participated in three European championships and two world championships, and even went to the Olympic Games in London together with the national team. Once Yulia managed to overtake her famous compatriot, Olympic champion Yulia Nestorenko, emotions are overflowing. After all, I was ahead of Nestorenko herself. She is an ideal for me, an idol in sports, and she knows it. She realized the dream of many girls when she won the Olympics, showed that it is possible and necessary to win. She has done a lot for the Belarusian sport but I am not going to yield to anyone on the treadmill. This statement shows what a kind, but at the same time, purposeful person Yulia Balikina was. In 2013, Balikina decided to end her sports career. At that time, she was disqualified for two years for doping. At the age of 29, the athlete ended her professional career, deciding to focus on her personal life and the education of her children. Since 2014, she worked as a coach teacher at Minsk Specialized Children's and Youth Sports School of Olympic Reserve No. 2 Dynamo. About a year before the incident, Yulia met Dmitry Vishtalyuk on a dating website. At first, they had a friendly relationship. Then the young people fell in love with each other and started dating, and then started living together. Dmitro Vishtalyuk himself was born in Ukraine, in Voroshilovgrad, now Luhansk. Then the family moved to Russia. For this reason, the suspect has Russian citizenship. His parents died tragically, and Dmitry moved to his uncle and aunt in Rogachev, where he grew up and learned to be a tealer and plasterer in college. He lived in Moscow for a while, then moved to Minsk. Since 2012, he first rented a room from an acquaintance, then an apartment in Serebrianka, Shabashil on construction sites. Then he was engaged in stretch ceilings together with an acquaintance. According to sources familiar with the story of the disappearance and murder of Yulia Balikina, when it became clear that the disappearance of the young woman might have a criminal trail, law enforcement officers inspected the apartment and the car left near the house. The traces of blood found in the apartment and the car and the consequences of the struggle indicated that the woman had been attacked and committed by a person well known to her. 
who had been to her house many times. It was decided to detain the 28-year-old boyfriend of the sportswoman, Dimitri. Agency sources said that from the moment of the man's detention, the investigating authorities had little doubt that the woman had been murdered, as indicated by the results of the apartment inspection and the detainee's testimony. While the search for the woman was underway, the detainee could not be charged with murder. The disappearance of the athlete was reported by her acquaintance, who had suspicions that she had disappeared after a meeting with her boyfriend, who, as it was later found out, was renovating her apartment and building a country house. At the same time, the law enforcement agencies drew attention to the fact that during interrogations for more than two weeks, the suspect, although he admitted that he had killed the woman, did not name the place where he had hidden the corpse. The agency interlocutors noted that, most likely, the man had a stereotype, no body, no case. It is difficult to say what guided the man who, having confessed to the murder, concealed information about where he hid the corpse. Most likely, he realized that the body would be found, but deliberately delayed the time so that the corpse of the woman would lie as long as possible in the forest, where the forest is full of animals, said the interlocutor of the agency. Analysis of the behavior of detainees in the commission of such crimes shows that, in conditions of stress, they have a powerful instinct of self-preservation, and a person is able to very clearly plan his behavior strategy during the preliminary investigation and in court, explained the expert. He said, there have been cases when a defendant who confessed to investigators to a murder, cooperated with the investigation, and confessed, then at trial, recanted his testimony, counting on the fact that the victim's corpse had lain in the ground for so long or had been eaten by animals that it would be impossible to determine the cause of death or the method of killing. Such a thing cannot be ruled out in this case either. The investigation has just begun. I don't think the case is complicated. It just resonated because of the identity of the murdered woman. And dozens of murders are committed per year on domestic grounds, the agency interlocutor said. Since November 8th, the search for the athlete has been going on around the clock, with volunteers and police searching for her. When it became clear that the disappearance had a criminal trace, the commander of the Interior Ministry's internal troops, Yuri Karayev, ordered that soldiers be assigned to search for the athlete's body. Every 24 hours, up to 300 soldiers of the Interior Ministry's internal troops were assigned to the search, and they were actively assisted by volunteers of the Angel Search and Rescue Team. According to volunteers, the area where the woman's body was searched was divided into squares, and a certain number of soldiers and volunteers were allocated to each square. Investigators and police coordinated the search. As a result, an area of 30 square kilometers was surveyed. The police announced that the body had been found in an official press release a few days later. The murder of the famous sportswoman caused numerous comments on the internet, including in social networks. Several private versions of the murder of Balakina's acquaintances were voiced. Her sports friends believed that the cause of the tragedy could be jealousy on the part of her boyfriend, with whom she had already broken up. But on the wave of renovation in the apartment, they resumed their relationship again. The law enforcement agencies also confirm that the accused in the murder was making repairs in the apartment of the athlete. Another reason for the murder, according to information from the athlete's circle of acquaintances, could have been self-interest and the usual male envy of a successful former girlfriend who decided to move on with her life without him. On October 28, 2015, when the trouble happened, they were no longer living together. But according to Dimitri, he was helping with the repairs. They quarreled earlier. Dimitri took $130 from Yulia and did not have time to return it. But they continued to communicate. There was no hatred for her. There was no animosity, Dmitri said. According to Vishtalyuk, he arrived around six o'clock that evening to help with the stretch ceiling in the bathroom. 
he started to work, but damaged the ceiling canvas a little. Balakina got very angry, but he explained that it was no big deal, and she calmed down, Dimitri claims. Then, Yulia called someone, returned to the bathroom, and began to tell him off, saying that he could not do anything normally. At that moment, Dimitri was standing on a chair with his back to her. I don't know what happened next. Just turned around and hit him with the hammer. I can't tell you in detail. And I don't remember, and it concerns very private, said Dimitri. Vishtalyuk doesn't remember how many blows he threw. He says five or six. Then Balakina fell on her side. Whether he hit her further, he says he does not remember. Then Vishtalyuk came to his senses and realized what he had done. Balakina was lying in the bathroom, wheezing. She had fallen there after the blows. Vishtalyuk took off his work clothes, put on the clothes he had arrived in, and fled the apartment. He didn't call an ambulance because he was scared. He can't explain why he was scared. He says he was panicking. On the way, he grabbed the keys to Yulia's car. He says, to leave, to escape. Vishtalyuk did not have a driver's license. According to him, he escaped from the apartment about half past 10 in the evening. After the tragedy, Dmitri got into Balikina's Kia Rio and drove to a hypermarket to put money on his phone. He called an acquaintance. He said he wanted to have a drink with him, but something didn't work out, and Vishtalyuk went to the train station. He sat in the waiting room until 2 a.m., not knowing what to do next. But around 2 a.m., he returned to Balikina's apartment. Yulia was no longer showing signs of life. Dmitri took the film, wrapped the body in it, and moved it to the corridor. He began to clean the bathroom. There was a lot of blood, according to him, like a stream. Then he put the jewelry together. He says he wanted to make it look like Julia was gone. Threw the used bucket and rag in the trash. I washed the hammer and put it on the balcony. Dimitri then drove the car to the driveway. He put his belongings, which had blood on them. He later threw them away from the house. He loaded the corpse into the trunk. Went just, no purpose at first, just to the Moscow Ring Road. I didn't know what to do, Vishtalyuk says. Thus, Dmitri drove along the highway. He started looking for a railroad station. The nearest one turned out to be Smolovici. He left his car near the station, took the nearest train, and returned to Minsk. The next day, Dmitri went to work. After that, he went to the train station thought of going to Smolevici, but fell asleep. He woke up at about 3 a.m. The next train was at 6 a.m. Dmitri bought a ticket for it. In Smolevici, the car was parked in the same place, and Vishtalyuk had taken the license plates off it even earlier. He got in his car and started driving around the neighborhood. He says he was looking for a place to dump it. Not far from Starina's village, he decided here. He pulled the body out, took it into the woods, covered it with brushwood and moss. Then he went to a gas station to drink coffee because he was very sleepy. Then he drove to Zudzina. He decided to abandon the car there. I returned to Minsk by train. On the way, I noticed that I had forgotten to get rid of Balikina's gold and jewelry. At first, I wanted to drop them back to the apartment, but I was afraid to go back there. He came to the apartment. But when Dmitri was already in the entrance, Yulia's brother called him and told him that they were going to break down the door of her apartment. The woman's disappearance had already been noticed and they were looking for her. Dmitri then put the jewelry in a gum bag he had in his bag and left the bag between floors. Then Dmitri, together with Balakina's brother, who drove up, began to wait for the police. The police arrived. Dmitri went to the police department. They asked him when he had last seen Yulia. He himself admits that he started to shake. The police noticed this and soon Dmitri confessed. In addition, one of the rings fell out of the bag and remained in Dmitri's pocket. It was found during the search at the police station. Dmitri denies that he was under the influence of drugs at the time of the murder. 
but admits that from time to time he could afford marijuana. Yulia, on the other hand, according to him, did not use drugs. Dmitri admitted that after the murder, he took some hashish from an acquaintance in the evening. Then, when he was at the train station, he used it in the car. He smoked some of it in Smolovici when he left his car there, and the rest of the drug was simply lost. The fact that he took some other things, boots, a set of underwear, Dmitri denies. He admits his guilt. He signed a confession of guilt. I want to ask for forgiveness from my relatives, although I know it's hard to forgive for something like this, Dmitri said. God will forgive, Balakina's mother replied. June 27, 2016. Minsk City Court passed a sentence on Dmitri Vishtalyuk, who was found guilty of the murder of famous Belarusian track and field athlete Yulia Balakina. He was sentenced to 23 years of imprisonment in a reinforced regime colony. In addition, Vishtalyuk was charged in favor of the victims, the father and mother of the deceased athlete, about 540 million of moral and property damage. Later, Yulia's mother explained to us, they do not count on this money, but the family will know that the accused will not go free before the appointed term. If the convicted person has not compensated for the damage caused, he will not be released under the amnesty. Support the video by liking and subscribing to the channel. And all the best to you. Be careful.